Good morning, everyone. Um, like Anna mentioned, I'm Sharon, and I'm part of the Wellbeing and Equity team here at Murdoch University. Um, I'm glad to be joining all of you. Um, before we get started, I would also like to acknowledge that Murdoch University is situated on the land of the Wajuk and Binjara Dinga people. We also extend this acknowledgement to you and from the lands and its people where you are joining us from. We pay our respect to the enduring and dynamic culture of the and the leaders of elders past, present, and emerging. And we like we we'll also like to, to acknowledge at Murdoch University. Um, we support our students and staff to study and work with pride. The overview and purpose of today's um, training, um, it will be divided into two parts. Um, the first part, we're going to give you some tips about supporting peers who raise well-being concern with you. And with that, what we mean is to recognize the signs and symptoms of mental health distress or crisis in others, um, co confident confidently respond to distress by delivering appropriate support, including recognizing your limitation and referring on to relevant support if and as appropriate. And then the second part, we will look at your own well-being in the role that you do, how to set boundaries, how to seek help for yourself, how to self-support and how to self-care. And in the space where we work, the mental health space, we have a lot of people with lived experience and I'm sure that all of you joining us today, you come here today with your own experience of mental health um, issues, either dealing with it yourself or assisting or living with people who have it. So we just want to acknowledge that and be mindful about some of the content that could be triggering to you. And also let us respect each person's what we share, be respectful and thoughtful of what you do share or disclose. Um, think about is your, um, your story safe to share? Are you safe to share it? Are you in a good space to talk about it? And also consider the impact that this might have on other people within this room and how they are going to receive it. And today's workshop will include a great deal of self-reflection. So I encourage you to dive deep with the content where it is safe and appropriate for you to do so. And take it as an opportunity for you to learn. You know, it might be that... Uh, um, um, a lot of the things covered might be familiar to you, but just take it also as an opportunity to learn something new. And remember to take care of yourself if you need at any point to, to leave the, the, the room, you are encouraged to do so, but please do reach out to, to myself, to Kylie, to Anna, or other services that might be available to you after the, the workshop. So the first part is understanding mental health crisis. When we say somebody is in crisis, we mean that they are in a state of great suffering and in need of immediate help. Um, their emotional pain may be so unbearable that some people might be thinking about taking their own life or in other instances, um, it might be so severe that uh, you know, they are not able to, to function um, by carrying out their daily activities that they would normally do, for instance. They might not be able to, to take care of themselves, you know, keep up their hygiene. And uh, as P, P leaders, you know, in your workplace, you would encounter students that will, your peers that will come to you facing crisis. So, how do, we, how do we deal with that? Based on the definition that you've seen on the previous slide, okay, 
um, when somebody is in crisis, they can present four different um, signs and symptoms, emotional signs, thoughts, their behavior, and their physical um, symptoms. Um, this is an open discussion. Let's come up with how do we know that this person is feeling distressed based on the four emotions. So either you can raise your hand and tell us about it, or you can write it if you're a little bit shy, write it in the, 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 the chat. So what kind of emotional signs will you think that somebody would present, you know? What kind of thoughts they would present with and what kind of behaviors or physical symptoms and sign? Any, any, any volunteer? I think in terms um, of emotions, they're probably mm -hmm. going to be, um, you know, quite obviously distressed. So possibly some, you know, obvious signs of depression, possibly anxiety, but, but being visibly distressed. Mm -hmm. Very good. Anybody else? Go ahead. I think that the inverse can also be true, though, right? That it's it's not always um, the the kind of the it, it often is, but it isn't always the classic symptoms that we might see for for something like depression. It might be uh, withdrawal, social isolation, um, or masking. People, you know, hide their emotions and their their distress um, so as not to distress others, so as to uh, maintain yeah their own sense of self and. Um, but then also kind of extremes as another instance of it, of uh, going from extreme, yeah, uh, low mood that we've just discussed or to um, extreme anger, whatever that might be. I think that there's some other instances. Yeah. That is a very good point you, you've you made, Jack, um, because sometimes people do mask out of habit, you know, or they don't want people to know that they are not feeling Okay, and, and these also are signs that we have to, to look for when we're working in this space. Anybody else? What about behaviors or the physical signs and symptoms of people? Yeah, I'll say in terms of the physical side, they can show, they can be isolated and they can just like stay by themselves rather than being in a group or being in contact with friends and family, um, they tend to be more isolated physically. Most definitely. And here we've got a few examples of what to look out for. It's not limited to that, but uh, it's just something that you guys can, can keep in mind. For instance, in terms of their emotion, the fear, they might show up being fearful of whatever is going on, the, the, the situation, they might be worried, they might be stressed, irritable, frustrated. And in terms of their thinking, I'm not good enough. And this shows that they displaying some kind of hopelessness, you know, having restful thoughts. They're not thinking right. They're not thinking clear. This difficulty focusing, they are distracted. Why even bother? Again, hopelessness. I don't know where to begin, being hopeless. And in terms of behavior, concealing plans, ignoring invitation, just like somebody previously mentioned, you know, isolating themselves. And something in the tertiary education, emailing academics at 2 a.m. in the morning, you know, when we're supposed to be sleeping and you're still emailing and asking questions not handling in or finishing assignments on time, increased substance use also. More time, doom scrolling. I think a lot of us, we, we do that. <laughs> we do that when we, we, we are not feeling 100%. In terms of the physical changes, this, this decreased hygiene habit, you know, maybe they're showing up, hair is not done, 
they if they normally clean shaven they show up you know with the bead that shows that they haven't shaved in a couple of days and changes in their sleep pattern if somebody approach you and say you know what i haven't been sleeping for the past couple of days or weeks and that may, might be a sign that something is keeping them awake at night. Um, more frequent sickness, calling in sick or complaining of headaches. Notic noticeable changes in their weight, you know, losing tremendous amount of weight in a short period of time if they're not an adult or have any other medical condition. And then appearing disabled. That's just a broad um, list, but it's not limited to that. I want to introduce you to the mental health continuum. Um, in the work that I do, I like to use the, the mental health continuum because it helps us view mental health as a positive and highlight signs and symptoms that we can all recognize and proactively improve. We think it is important to understand mental health as not just the absence of illness, but as a broad concept that applies to us all. Mental health, we look at it from mental health, from illness to wellness. Um, like the continuum show, mental health is not a, bi a binary state. You are not either mentally healthy or ill, because we can go from one end to the next at any given time, you know, depending on what we're going through in our personal life. And like we all know, life change. Today we might be thriving and tomorrow something happened, a death in the family happened, and all of a sudden, because of that, we found ourselves in crisis. And a lot of the time it happens because of other underlying issues. And a lot of the time, how do we, we know that maybe we are in crisis? If the situation's been persisting for two or more, two weeks or more, you know, where we are, our functioning are greatly impacted. However, somebody who, who is in crisis doesn't always need counseling or clinical intervention because we have coping and adaptive mechanism, you know, whether it's adaptive or maladaptive, but we are able to survive in crisis. When is it an issue is when we are unable to make do to survive. So this is when sometimes we might need additional help, we might need counseling, we might need clinical intervention. But it doesn't mean that we have a mental health illness. It's just that we are in crisis now and we need support. So we're going to talk now. Can you all hear me? <laughs> um, Recognising the signs of someone who might be struggling. So we've talked a little bit about the physical signs, what you might notice. But we're just going to drill down a little bit more into some of those specific behaviours. So not turning up to work or their classes, sudden disinterest in aspects of their life that they're normally very engaged with. Um, patterns of perfectionism. Perfectionism can be um, when people feel that they're not good enough and they just keep working harder and harder and harder. And they could be actually achieving good results, but it never feels enough that person and it can, can cause them to go into a bit of a spiral as we've said deterioration in their physical appearance they can be excessively fatigued um, without having necessarily extra demands on them so obviously this time of the year students are feeling pretty stressed pretty exhausted by the end of the year but if you notice that they seem to be excessively fatigued, that could be a sign of depression and or anxiety. Um, if you notice self-harm marks, maybe they're, they're picking constantly. So you might notice marks on their arms or their legs or their neck. 
um, where there previously wasn't those kind of marks. Um, someone mentioned before that they might stop making eye contact um, where they usually would have. And obviously talking about distress or an intent to self-harm. Often this comes as a general statement. It might be like, I might as well go and kill myself. They might say that in an offhand or sarcastic way. Another way they could they say is, I just don't see the point anymore. Um, why should I even bother? Life's not worth it. It can be these very generalised statements and the, there might be intention underneath that. They're trying to express some of those suicidal feelings and thoughts. Um, having big emotional roller coasters and not being able to regulate their big emotions is often a sign. Sudden withdrawal, which I think a lot of the comments in the comments box was about that isolating and withdrawing inwards. And like we said, expressions of hopelessness. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go into breakout rooms. I'm going to be presenting the case Jenny and Georgie will be presented by Cheryl. So we'll go into two rooms. And what we want you to do is have a look at the signs and symptoms. Do you think this person might be is experiencing a crisis? Basically, for Jenny, we recognise that she could be really struggling with a transition from being in a regional town, growing up in a small rural community, and then moving to a big university, feeling overwhelmed with the workload, with the expectations. Maybe she doesn't quite know where to go to support um, and just really maybe suffering from loneliness, isolation and overwhelm um, and using alcohol as a way to numb her feelings and it kind of distance herself from all of that stress and anxiety. And so she was using lots of maladaptive coping mechanisms um, to cope with that. That was our case. So I'll hand over to Cheryl. Um, for us, Georgie, he's an international student and he's been, uh, he has just moved to Australia within the past two weeks. And we've noticed that most probably he's dealing with homesickness and he started to isolate himself from the usual conversation that he would have in, in his classroom. And he's often seen staring out of the window during class. And uh, he said that he's excited to be in Perth, but he's missing home. And <laughs> as a coping, as a cook, the way that he was coping was he would go off for walks by himself through the, um, uh, the wetlands. And also he's found a llama, a spiritual person to talk to, though he hasn't been out yet to see them. So with him, he's dealing a lot with isolation, homesickness, and yeah, and he's not sleeping also. And a lot of the students mentioned that uh, what they would offer is offer Georgie maybe the opportunity to join groups and club on campus. And also they've mentioned that most probably on campus there would be um, resources for international students that they can access, that he can access. And furthermore, um, we also touched upon whether we would support, they, they would be in a capacity to support Georgie. And a lot of them mentioned that maybe refer, referring him on to more specialized services on campus. Yeah. Great. So now we're going to move and to the next part, which is responding, having those conversations and supporting our students, such as Jenny and Georgie. We need to make sure that we are prepared to have that conversation. So what sort of thing would you consider 
before approaching someone and having a conversation, somebody you maybe you've noticed that they might be in crisis, they're struggling a little bit. You know, what kind of things will you, you, you consider before actually going up to the person and having a chat? I would, um, I would say for the second scenario, Jenny's been drinking. So that would probably be a good indication that it's not the right time. So the second point there on the slide is, is it the right time or place? And, and are they comfortable? Mm -hmm. most, most definitely. And also in terms of yourself, you know, your headspace, your skills, the timing. Is the timing right? Like you, you, you rightly mentioned, Jenny has been drinking. Is the timing right? Is she sober enough so that I can have a conversation with, with, with her? The location, you know, um, are you just going to, if it's a social setting on campus, are you just going to walk up to her and talk to her there, you know? And safety, to have, is it safe to have the conversation right now? I am the, I'm, am I the best person culturally, you know, to, to, to have this conversation with, with uh, um, the, the person that we're going to have a conversation with? And on the slide... We, we also have some more example. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark. I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. <laughs> I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. After watching the video, what do you think are helpful skills and attributes or behavior of someone who is supporting and helping someone else? Um, I guess uh, staying quiet and just listening to their problems. That's the first thing. So mm -hmm. not trying to give them a response, just listening to them. Most definitely. Anybody else? I would say um, being non-judgmental, so showing that empathy um, and, and, yeah, and holding that space to have the conversation with them. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And sometimes it is difficult, you know, it is difficult to, to start that initial conversation. And I always uh, say, um think of it like if you feel as if I can't do it, you know, it's difficult, I'm afraid of, you know, 
Um, I don't know what to say. I'm a bit worried. I'm nervous about starting the conversation. Think about it the way you would ask somebody. If I were to ask all of you, what color are the walls in your bedroom? Automatically, you would, your mind will go to that color. And once you focus on the color of, of your bedroom wall, you would tell me, oh, it's purple. Oh, it's yellow. Oh, no, no, maybe it's lavender. So in a way, the question that I've asked is opening a loop in your brain and you are focused on the question itself. So when we're having a conversation, go with that. And where your focus is, the energy of that person will follow. You know, just open the loop. Don't be afraid. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's challenging. And there's no right or wrong way to some extent to, to, to do it. Just initiate the conversation. And like we said, being empathic, um, looking for the feeling and listening, listening for the feeling, what they are telling us. And so we have some tips on how to start a conversation. Um, we can start with something like, I've noticed, so for the example of Jenny, for example, I've noticed that you're drinking a lot lately, Jenny, or you're missing classes a lot, Jenny. And then the next part of your statement is, why is this important? You want to kind of give them some context as to why you're asking. So I'm wondering what's going on for you, Jenny, because... Um, it seems that you're not going to class as much anymore and you seem, you know, you seem really down at the moment and I've noticed you're drinking a lot. Um, and then often <laughs> you might get some pushback like, um, no, I'm fine, don't worry about it. Like she said, life is full of sunflowers. And so that's the point where you can persist, where you can say, are you sure? Because I don't want you to know that I care about you and if you're not okay, you can come and talk to me at any time. So we've got another example here. The den is our wellbeing drop-in space that we have. I've noticed you haven't been coming to the den lately. So there's that I've noticed. So I'm wondering if everything is okay because I've never known you to not come down and say hello each day. And then if they say no, are you sure? Um, I just noticed you were missing and I wanted to check in with you. Um, so noticed, wondering, because, and then the persist. And here's another example. Just wanted to check in and I'm wondering if you're all right. I noticed lately that you've been wearing the same clothes over and over again and you look out of sorts compared to earlier this year. Do you want to talk? And if they say, no, it's fine, I don't want to talk, you can say just, just to know that I'm here and I'm, there's a listening ear for you. So now we'll discuss what might be um, unhelpful. So if you can pop a few um, examples of what might be unhelpful in the chat box, um, we can have a look to see what, what, you, what you might think would be unhelpful when you're trying to have that conversation with somebody. Judgment, um, you look like a mess. <laughs> yeah, that would, that would kind of put somebody put somebody off from opening up to them wouldn't they accusations assumptions yeah absolutely um helpful things might be being open-minded and avoiding judgment and being patient yeah providing space for the person um yeah I love I love that one getting carried away and making it all about you talking about yourself and your stress is really <laughs> not so helpful um yeah, sounding judgy. And look, you might you might have had these experiences yourself as well. So this might be, you know, the times when you thought you'd like to reach out to somebody and um, they were unhelpful to you. So um, you've got some great examples there, being dismissive, being belittling. Um, and I love what James said, trying to problem solve rather than listening. That's a really big one, I think, for a lot of people is that we just jump into problem solving rather than um, actually listening to the feelings first. And often people have their own answers. Um, even though then they appear to not be coping very well and they're struggling, they have lots of internal resources. They have lots of problem-solving skills already. The fact that they're still in front of you today and trying to manage means that they've got something that they're using as a coping mechanism and they've also got some internal ways of problem-solving. But they might just need a little bit of help 
but the help usually comes after listening to the feelings first. Rationalizing, giving solutions, lots of great, great points, guys. <laughs> Being forceful, um, you guys are all over it. <laughs> You know all the answers already. So we're going to go and have a little look at this slide of some other things. So multitasking. So if you're like, oh, are you okay? Like is something going on? And then all of a sudden you're texting on your phone, checking TikTok, whatever. Um, that's really not showing the person that you're giving them that your full attention. The things that you've already mentioned, giving advice, making decisions for them. This is a really big one, I think, for um, for you as student leaders, is that it's really important to recognise that even if someone is in distress, they are capable of making decisions and we don't want to take over. We don't want to go, oh, you need to go to counselling. I'm going to take you up to counselling right now, which is one of the services that we have. Um, you, you want to allow them to come to that informed consent as well, that decision for themselves. Because part of someone being on a mental health continuum and maybe someone who's experiencing symptoms of depression, anxiety or other mental illness is part of recovering is actually having the autonomy to make those decisions for yourself and not having that taken away from you. So we really encourage you to think about are you taking over or are you letting them make those decisions? Um, another important thing that we've got on there is don't make promises you can't keep. Um, if, if you say, you can tell me your secret, I won't tell anybody, and then they say, actually, I've been thinking a lot about, about hurting myself or ending my life, um, you, that's not a secret you can actually keep. Um, you do have a responsibility to try to help that person get engaged with some services with qualified people who can deal with that so try not to make a promise that you can't keep you don't need to dive deep into people's traumas you don't need to understand the why the how what happened to that person to make them distressed to be able to help them in fact it's not very helpful to dig deep into that especially when you're not trained and that's not the right time or place to do that that person um, might have an underlying trauma that needs to be helped um, but there are specific services to deal with that and trained professionals that's outside of your scope so we don't don't um you know open the closet and <laughs> ask them to reveal all the skeletons in their closets um, because it's probably going to make them more distressed things that have also been mentioned is not asking them personal questions in a public space so if you're if you're standing in the food court waiting for your coffee don't ask them oh how did you know did you break up with your boyfriend last week <laughs> what's you know how did that go down and stuff like that not helpful toxic positivity everything's gonna be okay <laughs> it's really not helpful um it, you know, it's good to have hope for a better future, but when we kind of ram it down people's throats and tell them and be dismissive of their distress and of their feelings, it doesn't help them get better. It doesn't help them reach reach for help. So please avoid the, you know, the rainbow memes and <laughs> the, <laughs> that toxic positivity. Of course, not talking about your own experiences at that point, unless you feel it might be relevant and you're still centering the person in that conversation. So you might say, oh, when I first started uni, I really struggled too. And what I found helpful was going to speak to a peer academic coach. Is that something you think you might like to do? So you can bring in a little bit of your own experience, but you're not like, oh, yeah, it was terrible. I was so overwhelmed when I first started uni and it was the worst thing that ever happened to me. And it took me like six months to figure out I could go and get some help. And then you've made it all about you and not about actually helping the person. Um, saying other people have it worse, which is um, a great shown so beautifully in that Brene Brown video and taking on their crisis and, um, without supporting yourself, which is something that we see with peer leaders because you are all you know empathic people and you are helpers and you want to support your peers you can often take on a lot of your um your friends and your peers problems without having those boundaries and without being ready for it so this is why we want to encourage you to know what can be helpful um, not just for them but for you as the helper as well so i'll hand over to cheryl now to talk about how we can respond to distress Responding to distress, this is an ongoing conversation that um, 
we need to have to, with someone. When we look at responding to distress, we need to consider what does this person actually need or want. This isn't about us problem solving for them. It's about working together. We're gonna present you with Venus. Venus is one of the model that we can use when we are responding. It's not the only one, but it's the one that we use at uh, Murdoch University with our AWE team. Um, we look at the validating and empathizing with the person feeling an emotion as a first step. Secondly, ask about their needs and consider your need as the helper. Three, understand your limits. Four, offer appropriate support where is the, it is needed. So how do we validate? We have already spoken about the concept of empathy, but what do we mean when we say validate? Does anyone have any example? How do we validate somebody's feeling? If you want to type it in the chat box, uh, maybe an example, a sentence of how you might validate someone's feelings. That sounds really hard for you or that sounds really important to you. Yeah, that's a great example. Thanks, Emma. Any other ways that you might validate someone's feelings? Or oh, what do we think might happen if we invalidate someone's feeling? Yeah, so getting down to someone's level, don't speak from a sense of authority or to dictate how they should feel and how they should deal, absolutely. Um, responding to the issues. So talking about family, family issues. If they're talking about family issues, um, then stick to the, the topic that they're talking about. <laughs> so it's not like I'm talking about my family and you're like, oh, so how are uni assignments going and changing changing subject? Yeah, because that's showing you're actually listening carefully to what the content and the feelings that are coming with that. Um, they may get very agitated or angry. Um, yeah, look, ag agitation is definitely a way that people can show distress as well. And if someone's getting distressed, I don't know if your universities do training on how to de-escalate situations. Um, and if that's a situation that you've come across and that you're concerned about, definitely talk to your leaders in your in your organisation, your team managers and things like that, to learn those skills of how to de-escalate a situation. Um, if you are in public, it's a good idea to get help if you need to get help or, or look around and see if there's someone else who can help you de-escalate the situation. Often acknowledging someone's anger when they're heightened is a good thing because you're you're not just trying to like, it's okay, calm down, calm down, calm down. Um, that can often escalate a situation even more. So I think it's good to acknowledge their anger and say, I can see you're really angry right now. Why don't we um, step outside, go to a safe place, an open place where you're not feeling trapped in a room, all of those kind of de-escalation skills and say, I want to understand it from your perspective. Why don't we, why don't we go and um, get my team leader and we can discuss this outside or in another room so there are there's a few little quick de-escalation tips for you but hopefully your university has um has some training around that if that's something you feel you might need to help support your role um okay so so there's some examples for validating so it's you know i can see this is really upsetting for you frustrating it must be a horrible feeling and remember Empathy is choosing to be vulnerable, feeling with the person, um, similarly to the video that we watch. There are the four attributes of empathy, perspective talking, staying out of judgment, recognizing emotion in others, communicating your, your understanding of that person's feeling. And when we talk about needs, we classified it in four categories, the emotional needs, practical needs, information needs, companionship needs. And in terms of emotional needs, 
empathy falls into that, being understanding, trust, encouragement, practical needs, help the person to lighten the load. Okay, how can I help you? Organization need, ask them, how, like I say, how can I help? In terms of edu information need, education, you know, psychoeducation, problem solving, you don't solve the problem for them, but give them information that will allow them to problem solve. Refer them on to the right support. In terms of companionship needs, do they have a community that they can reach out to? Do they have connection? Are they able to share with others, you know, and preventing them from being alone? No! No, 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 you can't take my rocket to the top, Riley and I go to the moon! <sighs> Riley can't be done with me. Hey, it's gonna be okay. We can fix this. We just need to get back to headquarters. Which way to the train station? I had a whole trip planned for us. <gasps> hey, who's ticklish, huh? Here comes the tickle monster. Hey, Bing Bong, look at this. Oh, here's a fun game. You point to the train station and we all go there. Won't that be fun? Come on, let's go to the train station. I'm sorry they took your rocket. They took something that you loved. It's gone. Forever. Sadness. Don't make him feel worse. Sorry. It's all I had left of Riley. I bet you and Riley had great adventures. Oh, they were wonderful. Once we flew back in time, we had breakfast twice that day. Sadness! It sounds amazing. I bet Riley liked it. Oh, she did. We were best friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay now. Come on, the train station is this way. Who can identify with being born? Who can identify it as sadness or, or joys? And what does joy do that is unhelpful? And what does sadness do that is helpful? In terms of what we've been talking about, validating, listening, interpreting feelings. Well, I know that Joy tries to solve his problems firstly, tries to tell him to get up and go back and yeah, but that's not obviously. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Um, yeah, sadness tries to connect with with um the guy and understand his feelings. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when we listen for feeling, we can sometimes interpret somebody's need without asking. Also showing that not all needs are practical needs, you know? This just sitting and listening. And it ties back again to how we have a nature of problem solving. We see somebody struggling, all of a sudden we, we jump in, we want to solve their problem. We want to make them feel better. Most of the time, everybody wants us to treat them just like being born. Listen, you know? So ways that we can help, um help a person who is um is struggling is by asking some open-ended questions so we can actually ask like what it is what it is that they kind of want or need so for example a closed question is a yes or no answer an open-ended question ask them to engage and give you whatever answer they feel so instead of saying do you normally hand your assignments in late <laughs> You could ask, like, how do you normally go with handing your assignments in? Um, 
and you can see obviously sometimes a closed question can come across as judgmental as well so that's why an open-ended question is um, a much more gentle way of asking people instead of like well did you expect that you were going to fail your assignment or what did you expect or how is this different from your expectations so it's reframing your question and understanding that the person does have their own point of view um, and without making those assumptions which is someone that something that someone put in the chat box before is that is that making assumptions can be really harmful as well um, when we're trying to connect with another person and this will give you that insight into how that person is thinking what they're feeling and maybe what they're experiencing. So we don't know what we don't know. We, we can't tell the internal world of another person. So asking those open-ended questions is really helpful. So just to recap, you know, we're listening with empathy without judgment. We're asking them to um, elaborate and we're validating those emotions. Um, it can be really difficult for both yourself and the person you're talking with to open up. And so just knowing that that vulnerability it is difficult and making sure you're in the right space um, to be able to be a little bit vulnerable with that person as well. And it, it's going to feel awkward. It's going to feel, you know, you might yourself feel a little bit like, oh, I've never done this before or I don't know how to navigate this situation. And that's okay, like accepting that that's part of the situation unless it starts to go beyond that and you think oh, I really you know over my head now I don't know how to cope with this situation that's when you obviously need to get help and the person the, what we're what we're kind of really listening out for is someone expressing that there's a safety risk there and if they are thinking about hurting themselves, harming themselves, taking a really big risk like, oh, I don't care if I drive really fast and hit a tree or, you know, those kind of statements, then you need to, you need, you need to make contact with someone else who is equipped to help with that, like a counsellor or a doctor at your medical or nurse on the medical um, services on campus if you have that or external um, helplines, you know, like Lifeline, Beyond Blue have a, have a phone number as well you can ring. So there are other people who can help you. You're not going to be stuck alone with this person feeling like I don't know what to do. Um, and let the person know that there are dif different options. You know, again, it comes back to what is helpful for that person. But if someone is expressing thoughts or feelings around suicide, please get someone else involved in the conversation. So when do we refer to another person when we think this person who's struggling needs that extra help? The way you can kind of assess how urgent and how um, acute someone is in terms of thinking about suicide and potentially acting upon those thoughts is to think about and question the person what, how many times a day are you thinking about this? So um, that's the frequency. So I would say to Cheryl, like, how many times in the last week have you thought about hurting yourself? And maybe Cheryl says, um, I've only thought about it once or twice. And then I say, what, what happens when you have that thought? Oh, I just ignore it. It's, and then I just move on to something else. I just distract myself. So that's a low frequency and it's also a low intensity. So it's a, it's a thought that's coming, but Cheryl's able to quickly pivot from that and not focus on it. And the duration is only, you know, once or twice in the last week. And it's not an ongoing um, situation that's been going on for six months. So I'll be like, is this something new for you or is this something you struggle with for a long time? And Cheryl says, Oh, it's, you know, it's been going on for six months. That's a long duration. If Cheryl was to say, um, I think about hurting myself, you know, every half an hour in a day and I can't get it out of my head and it's all I think about and I have to, like, concentrate so hard on not listening to those thoughts, that's a really high intensity that's a really high frequency. And she can say, I've been feeling like this for six months, but in the last month it's gotten really bad. Um, that is someone who is acutely unwell and, and needs some really uh, professional support in that sense. So you want to ask them for permission. Can I help you? Is this something I can we can talk about and find some support strategies for them? So again, you're not coming in over the top and taking over. You're asking for consent. You're asking if you can help them with that. 
encourage them to seek help, which is like, I, I you know, I care about you. Um, I know it might be really scary to have these thoughts and thank you so much for telling me. Um, what can we do to make this better? Like, let's figure this out together. Let's see who we can talk to about because I care about you and I don't want this um, this to this to happen. Just because someone tells you that they are thinking of suicide or being uh, of of committing um sorry of ending their life doesn't mean that it's going to happen and it also doesn't mean that you've put the thought into their head if you've asked them so if the thoughts are already there and they're actually brave enough to um share that with you that means that they're asking for help and that they they don't actually want to act upon it so um you're not you're not putting an idea in someone's head if you ask them are you thinking of hurting yourself in fact what it, it, it does is it shows that I really want to care about you and I want to help you and I'm brave enough to have that conversation with you and help support you get help at Murdoch here we have counseling medical access and inclusion services and student assist so we have lots of on-campus supports which, which we're really lucky to have I'm sure um, there's diversity amongst the universities in terms of what kind of services on site they have but please get up to date with all of your um, your services that you have and your support networks what other support does the person have? Um, and always remember you can ring triple zero or lifeline if you need to. And then look for practical supports. Um, is Do they need academic support? Do they need to um, be connected in with some of your other services as well? And I'm aware that the time is wrapping up. So um, what can you, what kind of appropriate support can you offer? Um, you guys would all be kind of trained. I am I'm assuming or have some kind of idea about healthy lifestyle recommendations. So simple things like talking to the person about are they getting enough sleep? What's their diet like? Reducing drug and alcohol intake under periods of stress is really helpful. Can they do some, something for relaxation? Um, and then, but come back to their needs most importantly. So, um, yeah, we just one of the we just wanted to acknowledge that in peer work, we can often be working with our friends and we're, we're studying and we're in classes. And so it can be really hard to find the boundary between work and study and your personal life as well. So it's really important that you decide where your boundaries are and that you practice holding those boundaries as well. So it might be that you have a student come to you in your peer support role and then they're like, oh, can I have your phone number or can we like, you connect know, on social media, connect on know? socials mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And they might want to like WhatsApp you or like send you messages and things like that outside of your role. And we would really recommend that you think about that and take that time to consider is that something you want to do because you might end up saying yes and then that person is contacting you constantly and they're using you as the support person and then you're getting messages at two o'clock in the morning I'm really distressed I'm thinking about hurting myself and you're getting woken up in the middle of the night getting messages and freaking out <laughs> so we um we really recommend that you have those boundaries and that you communicate them in a like in a really gentle way that just says, look, um, I'm really happy to support you when I'm in my work role and you're a really great person, but I do need to keep my work role as my work role. And then ask them, like, who are your friends? Who are your supports? Who's your community? You know, have you thought about joining a guild club or have you, you know, what are your interests? And then try to steer them into some of those other support systems that they can lean into so that you don't become that one person that is now their biggest support person because that's really not your role. And to add on to, in terms of boundaries, um, we have to consider also, as peer leaders, how do you take care of yourself? How do, based on your study load, your workload, being able to say no to a shift? Maybe you've been asked, can you come in and work today? But you've got studies to do, you've got assignment to do, you're feeling overwhelmed yourself. So having that boundary and being able to say, no, I can't do it now, 
maybe I'll take a shift next week. Mm. And here at Murdoch University with our student ambassador, what we do from the get go, we let them know that we work with them mm -hmm. and we work around their schedule so that they can have that work study balance. And we are aware that they are student and that we need to take into accountability when we are shifting them mm -hmm. to, to work. So my advice for you guys is take the time for your studies, for the work and establish clear boundary from the beginning. And if right now you don't have it, go back to your roles, mm -hmm. ask your supervisors, you know, how can I have that work and study and personal balance? And these are all boundaries. These are boundaries. And the more you put them in, the more you practice putting them into place, you'll actually find that it it fills your cup and it feels good <laughs> because you're not feeling overstretched into 17 different directions as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So knowing your limits is how will you know when you're in over your head? Like what are the signs and symptoms in your body um, and in your thoughts and in your behaviour that will you, that will alarm you that actually I don't really know what to do in this situation and I'm feeling overwhelmed. Um, so if there's anyone who's still on the call who wants to put some comments in the chat box, think about how will you know that you're in over your head? Um, also asking yourself, which we just mentioned, what is my role to this person? What is my relationship? Because you're a peer support worker or peer worker doesn't mean you have to be everything to everyone. Um, I'm sure you're all, as I said, wonderfully empathic people who love to help, but it's not your role to take on everybody's, um, you know, everybody's crisis, everybody's distress you have limitations as well. And what are my skills and when do I need to refer? And, um, yeah, I think you kind of hopefully you'll have some um, ideas and feelings around that. If you don't, this is probably a good reflection activity to do as well. Um, and you should not be ashamed to admit your limitation, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a way to protect yourself and to protect your peers. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and because it, we know we're not all expected to be all things to all people. Um, so taking care of yourself is looking after yourself so that you can look after other people. We've You may have already heard it used lots of times, but the analogy of putting on your own mask. <laughs> oxygen mask in the plane before you help someone else. If you are giving and giving and giving and giving, you'll end up um, burnt, you'll end up burnt out, you'll end up not having the energy for yourself, let alone the energy to help other people as well. So it's really important that we as um as people who work in human-centred industries, um, that we look after ourselves so that we can show up for other people. So when we practice self-care, we're able to do these wonderful things like have less stress. Woohoo! We all want to be less stressed, right? <laughs> we want to have more resilience. So those days where things don't go right, you know, that you're able to bounce back from it, um, that you have more feelings of happiness and experience of happiness, more energy, you know, stronger relationships that bring meaning and joy to your life as well. So we need to have these to operate in a healthy way. And that is our holistic health, physical health, mental health, spiritual health, emotional health, financial health, all of those lovely things there. So we do need to take care of all of those aspects of ourselves. We mentioned the uh, self-care wheel so you could have a look at those domains. And in your own time, come up with six to ten examples in each of those domains of how do I like to look after myself? I mean, and feel free to pop it in the chat box. Or what are some ways that you look after yourself? For me, I have two little dogs and um, I love to come home and cuddle them and take them for a walk every day as soon as I get home. That's like my just stop for the day <laughs> connect with them go for a walk get out in nature and that's one thing that I do every day that fills my cup so that I can then be there for other people have you got an example Cheryl of something you do for your mental health 
for me in terms of the professional mm -hmm. um what i do is when i'm driving home mm -hmm. there's a point on the road where i switch off okay. every time i would reach that specific point mm -hmm. It's switching it off. Okay. I don't think about work. I don't think about anything else. So now I'm the other Cheryl. So yes. it helps me to just leave work and Brilliant. everything that we've dealt with during the day and mm -hmm. go on with my life. Yes. Yeah. So Excellent. that's my professional self-care. Yeah, a little ritual for yeah. yourself. <laughs> and something else to add in terms of the self-care will it depends on your needs mm. in that specific time. Maybe today it's not about the physical self-care. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need more of an emotional self-care. Mm. And maybe tomorrow something will happen at school or at work where you would need that psychological self-care. Mm -hmm. So it depends on like the continuum where we were talking, where you're sitting at that specific time, mm -hmm. what you need in that specific time. Like we spoke about the needs, the mm -hmm. four needs. So in that space, what is it that I need now? Mm -hmm. Some people will need more of the spiritual than the emotional. Mm -hmm. Some will need more personal than the professional self-care. So it's up to you, but it's good to have a balance. But always think of your needs. Yeah, absolutely. So have a good list <laughs> of in all those domains so that when you come home from work or school or whatever, you think, oh, I'm so drained. What do I need right now? If you've got that list, you've got some choices to pick up off as well. Okay. And finally, um, seeking support for yourself is really important. So there are some things that can happen when we work in the in human-centred fields. Um, we can take on other people's trauma. Just from listening to a story that is traumatic, we can go home and feel like we've actually experienced a degree of trauma listening to someone else's trauma. So that's something to kind of think about. If you go home and you can't stop thinking about that conversation that you had with someone and you're starting to feel distressed yourself, you might have taken on some vicarious trauma. If that's the case, we would want you to go and seek some help. Talk to somebody, maybe talk to a counsellor, maybe talk to your team leader, you know, maybe talk to a friend, but keeping it confidential. Um, you know, there's there's speaking to someone in your family about it who's supportive. Um, there are ways that we can deal with this. We don't have to bottle it up and carry it mm -hmm. ourselves, okay? So if someone has disclosed something traumatic, and you're feeling the impact of that, please look after yourself and get the support you need. There is no shame in seeking support. In fact, it's a sign of strength and courage. And consider also your lived experience that you bring to the job. And if something is triggering to you, it is a sign that there's more work to be done. Mm -hmm. So I will encourage you when you are in those situations and where it is tapping into your lived experience to reach out to people that are your supervisor, people that you normally seek support from and say, you know what, this is hitting too close to home. Mm -hmm. I've dealt with a situation today, it's too close to home, it's re-triggering what I've been through or what a friend or a close relative has gone to. So be mindful of your live experience, acknowledge it, it's part of who you are, there's no shame about that. And our live experience help us in this job because it brings out the empathy and the care that we need to do the job that we do. That's it. It's finding that balance between mm -hmm. being empathic because you, we all have lived experiences of things and we all feel for other people and feel with other people. But it's also knowing that we need to have some boundaries around that so that we're not taking on other people's um, experiences and emotions. But also if we're getting triggered, it means we're going to not be helpful for others mm -hmm. as well. And that's a sign that we need to look after ourselves first and foremost before we look after anybody else. So just finally, what does mental health and well-being look like at Murdoch University? Here's a beautiful picture of, um, you'll see lots of our student ambassadors on there um, working with students. So we have the DEN, which is our drop-in wellbeing space, um, which operates Monday to Friday. 
um, you know, business hours. We're down there doing lots of activities. Um, we look, run lots of workshops, lots of engaging ways to um, help the students connect, build friendships, access supports and get a sense of belonging um, as well. So we've got lots of creative um, workshops that we do. We have an art therapist on our team who works with the students as well. Um, and we can access and help students um, be linked in with those other support services as they need to, whether it be counselling, whether it be the medical um, service or whether they need access and inclusion or connecting with the Guild and Student Assist and other aspects and of support, and academic yeah. support as well. Mm -hmm. So we do, we have lots of fun. Um, we provide a lot of um, community support for our um, students as well. We do things like food drives where we give away, we collect food donations, clothing donations, um, where we do lots of amazing health promotion events as well. And um, a lot of uh, the main driver of our program is uh, social connection and suicide prevention as well. So lots of fun things. Um, and, and we also have a um, very good program for our international students absolutely yeah where they can drop in our international cafe mm -hmm. once a week and it's the time where they would have connection sometimes this would be the only time mm -hmm. in a week or weeks that they would actually come and have a chat with other people you know because of the loneliness the isolation language barriers and things like that and also in terms of our student ambassador we offer them a huge lots of uh, training mm -hmm. that is very beneficial in terms of the roles that they do, how they uh, deal with distress, crisis, mm -hmm. boundaries, and, and all of that. Yeah, so we're very lucky to have a fantastic team of student ambassadors, but we also provide them with a lot of training and support as well. And um, also we provide them with that psychological support as well. So when they're feeling in over their head, they have um, some clinical support as well for them. So we're, we're very grateful for our team and our service at Murdoch. Do we still have students? Yeah, let's have a look. If there's any students who wanted to ask a question, maybe we'll pause the video there and um, we'll come back to you, Anna. Thank you so much for staying behind um, and uh, finishing your presentation. I know you spend a lot of time preparing this and thanks for students who were able to stay back as well. Um, and yeah, please feel welcome to ask any questions, otherwise, I am happy to leave it there and I'll let you continue with your afternoons.